you know, we've, we've still got we've still got bills to pay. You know, um, and and the mention of a lockdown again, well, well, we'll see where we go. But you know, people need to stay positive. In hindsight, you know, the coaches with coaches and boxers, they still need to maintain that rapport and that and that connection. You know, and don't distance yourself while while nothing's going on. You know, as with me, I'm switched on 24/7. We're always on the WhatsApp groups. We're trying to implement some little 5k runs, 10k runs, just to do things, just to keep everyone stimulated. In hindsight, you know, when are we looking at boxing again? Welcome back to the Boxing Club at Windmill HQ. It's another episode of the Punchline Podcast. Today's guest is a professional and amateur coach in the sport of boxing. Um, coaching at Hoddesdon Boxing Club, also knows the Bear Cage. So I'm going to ask Sab to introduce himself. Good morning, my, my name is Sab Leo. I'm the uh, head coach of the Hoddesdon Boxing Academy and also the, the, the head coach of the Bear Cage, which is the professional side of the boxing section. Uh, the club is based in Hodderson itself uh, at the Robert Gillian Hall, which is uh, just off Burford Street, just off the A10, uh, M25. Um, the building is stooped in tradition and history. Uh, one of the acting trustees has a scrapbook that thick of, of its entire history. It's regalia. It was Victorian. It was a cinema dance hall. Um, apparently Cliff Richard played there with his band. Uh, one of his films was made there as well. So, um, I came along in 1992, um, after just, uh, not being able to, um, continue my coaching duties, uh, beforehand at the Trojan Police Amateur Boxing Club, which was in Brentfield Road, uh, the journey and the distance was just was just too much for me. Uh, so I looked for something a bit more local. And um, originally I went to Cheson. I went to Cheson Boxing Club and uh, popped in to see Mark. Um, I had a level one, you know, I had a level one certificate. Um, asked him if he needed any help, but um, the club was thriving. And uh, he said, thanks, but no thanks. We've, you know, we've got enough coaches here. So um, I just wanted to make use of of myself as a coach, so therefore went to uh, pop down to the Haleybury Club because I'd heard that they had uh, boxing sessions there only twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Walked in uh, and was met by um, an elderly gentleman by the name of Frank Grigg. I introduced myself uh, and told him what I had done, and uh, he sort of kind of looked up to the sky and thought, you know, my prayers have been answered. We could do with a coach, and um, I met the the coach currently that was there, Brian Dawson. Uh, and he introduced me to it, really, just a handful of boxers. They weren't boxers as such, they were just keep fitters. But uh, they'd actually originated from the Ware Boys Club uh, in Ware in Hertfordshire, which was, uh, again, another successful amateur club and produced some some great boxers. Steve Mole, Gene Knowles, uh, Nicky Bardle, Mark Wilkinson. Um, they were based at the Drill Hall in Ware, and for whatever reason... They moved out of there and and set up camping in the Haleybury Club. So um, by that time, they were just ticking over and I don't think they were competing. So I just shadowed Brian, um, you know, took took some guys on the pads and, and, and things like that. But um, it came to a point where Brian, who was an active black cab driver, um, he he was losing the, 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 the novelty of, of being there coaching because he'd been a coach for such such a long time. So therefore, all of a sudden, um, the responsibility was put on my shoulders. And uh, it happened overnight. Here we are, 28 years later. <laughs> I'm still there. It's like a maximum prison sentence, but uh, it, it's been hard. But I've I've enjoyed every minute of it. So when you actually took over, what was the the response from the boxers? What 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 did they think? Obviously, I wasn't uh, I wasn't a local because um, if we take it right back, I I started. I started when I was very young at uh, Ace ABC, which was uh, in Edgware, which come under the Northwest London region. And uh, the gym was based at Edgware School. And it was a, you know, an old fashioned school gymnasium, which had the, the climbing frames and the, the pommel horse and the rings. And um, I, I 
made a phone call to a gentleman by the name of Bernie Smythe, uh, who told me to pop up, and we and I, I popped up there, and um, it was very basic. The bags were kept in a in a storage container, which we we had to help uh, put up, set up. The floor was a the boxing ring was a a gym was on the floor. So again, it took about 25, 30 minutes to set everything up. Um, training commenced either with a run in the car park or wall to wall up up the bars, touch the top all the way down. No health and safety involved at all. Um, but um, he was a lovely man. And my first experience of getting whacked was putting a set of gloves on, going into the ring with one of his assisting coaches. And I, for the life, can't remember his name. And the first thing he said, right, is put your hands up. But before we start, tie your shoelace. And as I've looked down, he's clumped me. <laughs> he's like, rule number one, never take your eyes off your opponent. And it's a trait that I carry on with even to this day. It's things that you remember back in the day that you absorb. And then you, you know, you, um, you basically try your luck on, on these, these little kids when they come in through the, through the, through the door. And, um, it was great. Bernie was a, a consummate pro as well. And his style was very rough and rugged, come forward. And, um, you know, I, I slowly developed under him. I wasn't just boxing. I was playing football and doing other sports. Uh, was I taking it serious at the time? No, but it was just another source of of keeping fit and uh i was a main sparring partner for uh, for, for probably his best boxer there which was um uh, darren mcdonough um who was a who's a, a very very tough tough kid who'd, who'd had dozens of, of fights and yeah i hold my hand up he used me as a punch bag but i did learn and develop and started getting the benefit and the benefit of the doubt and uh my own back on him but uh, we became good friends as there were some other boxers and um, Finchley used to come up with the Olivers. You know, they'd, they'd bring some boxers up, uh, Mumford and McNamara and some others. And um, it, was, it, was, it was nice. It wasn't overly crowded. You got your training in. And uh, I was only a kid. And I was making my own way there by bus. And I was coming home late. But, you know, back then, that was the there was no, yeah, it was, it was normal. I mean, it, it would take me an hour and a half, two hours to get there. And it would take me the same kind of time back. And... I'll be up for school the next morning. But it gave me a lot of self-esteem and self-confidence because before I went to the boxing, where I moved into the, the area, Hendon, um, it was a small Italian sort of Jewish community as well. And there wasn't many boys around there to play with. And um, the estate up the road was where, where, where it was happening. And a couple of times I was on the outside looking in. Uh, yeah, I'd been bullied and sort of punched and kicked and, you know, get, get out of here and... Um, I thought I need to toughen up. And ironically, them very same individuals that were doing that to me earned my respect a couple of years later. And then I became sort of part of their, a part of the, like the fellowship. But going back to the boxing, um, it was an era where you stayed with a club, you trained with a club. And um, when you were asked to box, you were told when you were boxing where to meet your coach. No social media. No mobile phones, no checking up on who the opponent is, what he's done, Southpaw or Orthodox. You just turned up and boxed. And the majority of my fights that I had, I had no inkling on who, who they were until I met them across the ring. And uh, it was great. You know, it was the uh, it was the tension of being in a crowded changing room, not knowing who your opponent was, because it could be any of them 20 individuals that were in there. And... Um, um, I suffered a few losses to begin with because, A, again, not taking it serious, but it, I was enjoying the boxing, um, which sounds strange. I suppose it's a different atmosphere as well because when I used to box, I won't give my age away, but people used to smoke in the arenas. So it was normal to have a smoke indoors and you just walk through all the smoke. Yeah, absolutely. And... Most, most, of my, most of my fights were in working men's clubs and uh, football clubs. I think I boxed at Harrow Borough Football Club a dozen times. And just like the Camden Centre in Murray Street, you know, the, the, the room, you couldn't see the ceiling because it was just filled with smoke. And, uh, but you just got on with it, you know, and um, it was just great. I mean, I must have had, I boxed the same four or five guys twice over, three times over. So once I'd boxed them once, I'd probably get there, you know, I'd understand by boxing them again the following week. Or maybe at the end of the week, 
that I've got their number this time round. And, um, you know, it was great. I never got hurt in, while I was in the ring uh, under Bernie. And um, Bernie retired. Bernie went to, 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 to Ilminster near Yeovil. Um, so there I was looking for somewhere else to go. And um, at that time, now I was getting older, um, I had a girlfriend uh, based in Broxbourne and went to Chesant. And um, that was tough. That was very tough. Uh, you know, worked really hard there. The coaches were, were full on, very physical and very mental, but um, uh, they were producing some great boxers. And uh, I was glad to be in the mix. But you know what it is with a, you know, a boxer needs to co gel with a coach and then, and the surroundings and the environment. And um, I stuck around. Uh, and I just had the one contest there. And um, after that, I just, um, I don't know, I, I just wanted another fresh challenge. So lo and behold, I'm in Hertfordshire, and yet all of a sudden I've taken myself down to, to South London, to, to Fitzroy Lodge. And uh, that <laughs> that just holds so many great memories. You know, to, Another big club? Brilliant club. To, to walk in there, and then you've got Guy Williamson, you know, super heavyweight, ABA champion, Roy Connor, you know, uh, Adrian Carew, Adrian Dodson, uh, he was based at the Lynn, but he was he was there most of the time, you know. And um, I met the legend, Mick Carney, even though he didn't say anything to me for six, seven weeks, because that's what he was like. He'd, 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 he'd watch you come through the door and make sure that you're there on a regular basis before he even just walked over and just said a few words. And I remember it so well. That I was, normally swear words. No, no, I was just in the mirror, <laughs> shadow box, and he just came in and he just came from behind and just sort of adjusted, turned the shoulder, tucked the chin in, and I walked away. And I felt like I'd been touched by the hand of God. You know, Mick spoke to me, Mick touched me, and then that was it. Got involved in sparring, but it was so regimental there, but it was it was brilliant. It was, so, it was you know, the respect. You spar between six and seven. You get there late, you're not sparring. It's as simple as that. doesn't matter if you've missed the bus, the train, it, it's done. And then he had an assisting coach there, Billy Webster, who was just phenomenal, you know, for an old man on the pads. Just absolutely mind-blowing, especially the work in the pocket. Just all the body work was just brilliant. And it was just the combination of them two. And there were other assisting coaches, but it was like a family there, you know, being a lodge boy, it was it was, it was, was brilliant. And um, I'd say that when people say to me, what's your toughest fight, you know, what's your toughest fight? My toughest fight were two spars that I had there. And I remember them so well. Roy Connor, Roy Connor was just a genius and a pleasure to watch. And I came out of there black and blue, but it was, <laughs> it was an experience. I you never enjoyed it. <laughs> absolutely. And the other spy I had was, was Adrian Carew, Adrian Dodson, who'd, who'd won the ABAs with the, with the Lynn and, um, cocky, arrogant, but so com super confident in the ring. And, um, I remember the first occasion we were all around the ring and, uh, Mick said, go and get in your next. And as I sort of went in through the rope, he's going, no, 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 I'm not sparring him. And so I'm looking at Mick, Mick going, what's the problem? He went, no, no, he's not a middleweight, which I was at the time. He went, he's not a middleweight. He's more like a light heavyweight. Get him out. And it offended me. And I thought, and I looked at Mick, Mick went, sorry, just jump in the other ring. So I jumped in the other ring and sparred um, Eddie Nelson, I think it was. And then the following Thursday, he said, you can get in the ring now. Because I think what he was doing was watching me from the other side, and I got in the ring, and we had we had a, we had a war basically. And it, but again, it was a learning curve for me. And um, he came over after I was I was I was doing me um I was doing me circuit, me groundwork, and he's like, "Come on, move up. I'll I'll join him with you." And it, just a mark of respect. It was just brilliant. But that's what it was like there. It was just it was family. Um, and I stayed there for a short while, uh, and unfortunately, circumstances <laughs> forced me to move. And um, I was looking for another club. Um, I tried Repton. I, I just didn't bode with it. Um, new enterprise. So I took myself to the All-Stars down Harrow Road because I'd, I'd originally, Stevie Palmer, one of the coaches, would always bring Kenny Thomas, the super heavyweight, down to the lodge to spar. And we got on really well. And it was through there that I just, I just, I just went there and worked under Mr. Akai as well. And it was a good club. It was a very good club and it was tough. But it's just how I liked it. It just being at the lodge reminded me of when when um, after Rocky gets beaten by Club Lang and he walks into Apollo's den, you know, when the water's dripping down the wall and you can hear the, the trains. Place. Oh, it's brilliant. Brilliant. That that smell. 
You know, you, ne you never lose that sense of smell. And the All-Stars was kind of similar as well, and it was tough. You know, and everyone just wanted, even in Spine, everyone wanted to take your head off. And it was good. And going, running out in groups up and down around Notting Hill and Harrow Road, superb. Um, and I had my last contest for that. And then the, the thing is, I was even offered to turn pro, and I, I couldn't do it. Because if I wasn't committed as an amateur, how the hell was I going to be committed as a pro? But I wanted to stay in and get involved with boxing. So um, I popped up to Trojan. And uh, there, were, there were thoughts of making a comeback. But by now, I'd sort of ballooned a bit in weight. And uh, where I was grabbing a, a, a few kids and trying to work with them, um, I couldn't train myself. So I just made a decision that the next time they've got a, a level one coming up, I'm just going to sign up, get my badge, and work alongside. And now I was working alongside Stevie Newland, who's at the Hooks, you know, who's running a, a tremendous uh, another big club, another big <laughs> club. Um, there was Paul, uh, there was Phil Pearson, who was a senior coach, um, and there was a couple of others. But it, it was good, you know. And, and Steve and myself, we had the you had the uh, like the Barretts and the Kakorans and the, the Mongans and the O'Donnells and the McDonalds because they were based just around the side of Brent Park and. Um, they were great. You know, it was just so much talent. But for me, it was becoming such a struggle li living up in Hertfordshire and trying to get down and more so more so than ever, I was having to turn back on the A406 because the traffic was horrendous and uh, I thought I'd need to find something more local, uh, which I did. But, I mean, we left amicably and then um, I based myself up there. And, um, again, I, I, I became like a, a student to Brian and just learning the ropes. And then when Brian went, I sort of had to step up. And um, I did have guidance from Frank, the, the the secretary. The facility itself was, as I said, it was a dance hall before. And um, they still had an entertainment license, which meant they 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 rented it out for hire to, to for birthday parties and weddings. I mean, the amount of people that have walked in there, even now, I've said, oh, I had my uh, wedding reception in here, or I had this, and I thought, oh, wow, okay. But I was very anti-committee. Because I'm thinking, boys are starting to come in. The roof at the back is starting to f collapse. You know, that ring is a floor ring and it, we need to have it modified. So Frank was always fighting my corner at the committee meetings. But the committee were just elderly men that were very, uh, we'll talk about it at the next meeting. We'll talk about it at the next meeting. So I just went out of my way one day and went and bought four or five brackets and got them fixed, put the bags on it. And to their shock, they were like, Oh my God, you know, should you not seek permission? I went, guys, they're bringing a revenue in. These boxes are bringing a revenue in. When they walk into a hall and it's empty because the bags are situated in the back room, all they can see, how is this a boxing club? It's, there's nothing here. So then I became a rebel and put a bracket up and then another bracket and another bracket. And then me and Frank con concocted an idea to get a ring. But it wasn't a, a, a freestanding ring. It was a fixed standing ring. And then all of a sudden, you know, they were saying, right, okay, we're going to have to cut the, uh, the, the, the renting this out for, for parties and that, providing that you're getting the income in to keep this building going. And a you know pressure. what? <laughs> Only a bit of pressure, but there was no sponsorship or anything like that. But the, the kids were coming through. And, you know, I've been there sort of 28 years. And I can honestly say out of them, probably about eight or nine of them years, I've, I've been on my own. Not consistently, but just, you know, stop gaps and, um, See, my coaching career is very similar because when I took over, there were two punch bags and we did the same. We used to put the bags up to start the session and take them down because we were in a sports hall and they used it for basketball and football. So we had to remove the bags every session. Well, the, the, the thing was, it was called the Haleybury Boys Club. So then when you, when you sort of dig a little bit deeper, just up the road is the Haleybury School, the Haleybury College. You know, uh, it's where Frank, Frank's, Frank Warren's boys went. You know, it's, uh, and it's got a lot of tradition. And um, Haleybury Boys Club. And I'm thinking times are changing, you know. I remember a couple of times some, some girls were in there. And straight away the committee going, what are they doing in here? It's a boys club. You, you can't be saying that anymore now, you know. They should be entitled to train here. And, um, you know, they sort of turned up their nose and, okay, crack on. And um, the next thing is, I'm thinking, hey, Bree, why are we still connect? Are we still connected with with the school? Because that was their kind of youth club before they their facilities extended and they built everything on campus, and that was given to a trust, and then the trust designated three trustees, uh, 
to look after, you know, to, to look after and safeguard the building. So I just put it to the boxers. I went, guys, why don't we change the name? We're still an umbrella club. You know, we're still a club within a club. It's still the Haleybury Club, but let's get at the boxing section out there and call it something different. A bit more formal. The yeah. moment we called it Hoddeston, because it's in Hoddeston, you wouldn't believe the amount of people that came through that door because they genuinely felt that the Haleybury Club only belonged to Haleybury members of the school. Now all of a sudden it's open to the community and they were flooding through. They were flooding through and there was, you know, there was so much talent that walked walked through the door, you know. Um, and again, I needed help. I needed help. And then we just had a couple of guys that came in. Some of the wear boys like Gene and that, they, they, they stayed behind to help coach and that, which was great because their experience was valuable. Um, and then all of a sudden we started to proceed with putting, you know, putting shows on. Uh, the Red Corner was never, you know, all my boxers. I remember one show that I'd done at a drill hall. I must have put on about 25, 30 bouts. I think I must have only had two or three representing the club. And that was back then. But um, still put the show on, generated a revenue, which kept the committee happy. And then it was a case of, right, I need more skipping ropes. I need head guards. I need groin protectors. And there was always a clash for the first several years. And then, um, unfortunately, we lost Frank. And that, that was such a big blow because he was... He was like the elder spokesman, you know. And then I put myself on the committee. And as as, as a committee member, when it comes to any other business, I said, well, yeah, there isn't any other business. It's the boxing side of the business. And then I'd sort of speak out about things and, you know, you need to come here and have a look. You only come in here just for the meetings. You're not popping in to see the amount of kids that we've got that we're taking off the streets. And then, again, it was a knock-on effect. And with some of the kids came... Some of the parents who owned some businesses who were willing to put money in, you know, put their hands in their pockets and buy some head guards, buy some ropes. And that's how it, it sort of started to flourish. Um, from a coaching aspect, I was still learning. Um, I had the wall pull over my eyes a few times in terms of matching, and that never happened again. So I was learning. But then being a coach, you wasn't just a coach. Now all of a sudden you were listening now. You know, now you become a friend. Then you become a mentor, you know, you become an agony uncle. You've got the agony aunts, but now you become an agony uncle. Um, and it just consumes you like it's consumed me. And you don't just turn up, unlock the door, coach, lock the door, go home. It was 24-7. All of a sudden, people are phoning you up. They're getting to know you. You're, on, you're new on the circuit, but we've got a show here. We've got a show there. And I was never, I'm thinking, well, we're on, we're on the start of something good here. And um, it it generated and it just blossomed, you know. And then we started getting active boxers from other clubs that, that would, were, were joining in. You know, they'd heard probably about the way the club was being run and it was run the way I wanted it to run and then the, um, the, the training methods. And um, but as, 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 we explained, as I explained it before, when someone would come and I, I knew who they were, I'm like, oh, don't you box for um, you know, don't you box for so and so? And they're like, yeah, yeah, but you know, I've left now, and I never want to fall out with people. So I do. Hold on, I'm just gonna just gonna check, and then I'll phone that coach up and say, listen, I've got um, Joe Bloggs has just walked in. How oh, is he now? Yeah, is everything okay? Well, first I've heard of it. I went right. Okay, what I'm gonna do is, I'm I'm gonna just park it there. I'm gonna tell him he, he's not allowed to train. No, no, he can train. I went, no, no, I don't want any issues here. He can come back to you. Deal the problem. If he intends to come back, he's already got off on the wrong side of bed because he's lied to me and I, I can't work with people like that. And um, go in the change room. Sorry, son, you're going to have to leave. And there was a couple of times when it was, you know, it become verbally abusive and that. But, you know, I, I had to stick to my guns and that's how it should be, you know. But then in my era and your era, when we where we trained is where we stayed. It was never the, the indulgence of, going to another club behind your coach's back and things like that. That now is rife, absolutely rife. It happens. Boxing, they're not big circles, they're small circles, and it'll always come back in a roundabout way. And with social media, you're always going to get found out, you know. So um, if there's something out there that they want and, they, and they're, they're seeking more of it, there's nothing stopping them from talking to the coach. It doesn't have to be cloak and dagger. Most of the time, it's miscommunication. 
It is miscommunication. I mean, I'm, I'm, if it, I, I've always, I've always said that when when an individual comes to me, I keep on saying to them, don't, don't, don't be, don't just come along for the ride. Come for the journey. Okay, let's just see what we can do with you, and see where we can go with progression and development. And when they're becoming better within themselves and more confident, and 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 their performances, there's always someone in the back whispering or or whatever and all of a sudden they lose their focus and then they don't start coming to the club and then before you know it they're on social media in front of a mirror somewhere else and then you've got to go out of your way thinking here we go phone them up what's the problem oh no no i just couldn't get there so i i said but you do know you know you should be courteous and phone me up and say i can't get to the gym do you mind if and then from there I'll go, okay, I'll phone the coach up and let them know. And then then it becomes a sequence of events. By you doing what you've done, you've made it awkward. And then you become, the coacher box, the relationship becomes fractured. And being Italian, I'm stubborn. I'm very stubborn. When I find out things like that happen, I completely cut off, completely cut off. And it's happened to me over the years. So, so many times I've, I've lost count. You know, which is a shame because they turn up with good intentions. It always ends up with bad intentions. But it's not from my part. They're obviously seeking something else that I thought they were getting with us. And all of a sudden, they're going somewhere else. So, Do you think sometimes they move somewhere else and still don't find what they're looking for? And then, Yeah, you know, they always come out with the saying, the grass is always greener, etc. They can't come back because they feel they've offended you or... Um, as you say, miscommunication is, is the biggest is the biggest factor here, but or communication is the biggest factor. But I've 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 been abroad, not been down the club, and people are missing, and then it's got back to me that they've gone somewhere else. And now I have a policy now that once you leave, you don't come, you don't come back because if if it wasn't good enough for you at the time, then it's not going to be good enough for you thereafter. And 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 that's and that's it. Um, you know, it can we can open a big can of worms here in in regards to subjects about boxers and, but it it has become a self a selfish sport. It really has, not from a coach's perspective, you know, but from the individual. You you know you, they come along, you build them into something great, um, and then all of a sudden they they seem to think that there's something else out there that that they can that they can um, that they can work on in improving. But you're thinking. Well, you've come to me from scratch. You've won. You've won. You know. You've won a national title. You've boxed in the Tri Nations. Uh, all of a sudden, you're on the talent thing. What more? What more are you looking for? Now you're in a good position. Now you have to just maintain focus, steady the ship, and just keep working. But then again, there's always outside influences, and that is that is the thing. You know, outside influences. Let's talk about something controversial these boxing tutors and personal trainers and white collar fighters and people who know everything about boxing except for the rules <laughs> how can we control it because a lot of kids I've seen on social media we're doing a charity fight we're fighting in the park we're doing a media thing we're doing this that. I'll get called can we use your ring we're doing this media thing and we're cha- raising money for charity and I, we do- I completely switch off to I, I've, I, I've had the contacts as well you know, oh, uh, me and my friends are doing a white collar. Good luck. Can we? You no. I don't let them finish the sentence. My club is for amateurs and the pros. Nothing in between. There is no such thing as a semi-professional boxer. So, from a safety point of view, obviously these events go on. These events go on. People turn a blind eye, you know. But then they're the boxers. The things that really great us as coaches that have worked from the fundamentals, grassroots, are these S&Cs, PTs, call them whatever we want to call them, you know, certificated in in pads. Unless you get into an amateur, but listen, there's, there's a lot of pro, there's a lot of pro coaches out there that have never gone into an amateur gym. I've had a pro license for eight years. There are some out there that haven't even had a pro license for 18 months. All of a sudden, they're the next best thing. Why are they the next best thing? Because they've had boxers put on their laps. 
because again, it's that source of it's not what you know, it's who you know. When see someone, I've I've been told a few times, Sab's a great amateur coach, but he's very inexperienced as a pro coach, which is strange because I've had a license for eight years. Doesn't mean it's been dormant for the last eight years. I've been involved in twenty five professional fights in a corner, twenty four wins and one draw. Out of them, two titles, Southern Area and a WBC International. But I'm inexperienced. But when someone says to me, you're a great amateur coach, but inexperienced as a pro coach, I get offended because I'd rather him turn around and say, you're a great coach. Because I know, I mean, I've got amateurs that will ping certain pros. Such is the level and standard of the way I produce them. And I'm a bit disappointed because over the last several years, I've had a, an absolute, a growing list of boxers that have come to me from other clubs and they train and it's that, oh, you know what, I've learned so much today, more than I have in the last two years. At my, you know. That doesn't just offend me, that should offend the other coach if he, if he finds something out like that. It's nonsense, it's nonsense chat. It's just that the novelty at the time, they're happy because they're in that environment. But then when the work starts to kick in, the hard graft and things like that, and then you see a decline, then you know for real, this is going to end up bad. But I've had boxers where I've, they've done nothing and I've put them on platforms. I've put them up there with the hope and anticipation that because I'm doing good work with them and nothing's broken, so there's nothing to fix, that they'll turn with me. You know, turn over with me. Stay as part of the club. But again, outside influences, not what you know, who you know, and they move on. And it is a kick in the teeth because of the time and effort. You know, um, as a pro, I noticed, especially in the beginning of careers, there's a big buzz around the fight, uh, big support. But when a pro loses a fight, nobody's to be seen. It's not, it's, you know what? It's not just that as well. It's just that um, f for a pro debut, not at the moment now with, with, with the way COVID is, they select some, whoever we're with, they, you know, there's always an anticipation that you'll go and support that, that person for his, his pro debut, you know? And he, he can do 150, 200. He, can, he, might, he might do three, 400 tickets. And then he's had a debut. You know he's going to have someone with a padded record. And the next time he boxes, then there becomes a decline. The, you know, the, being a realist, it's the scenario of having to, you know, oh, I'm boxing again in six weeks' time. Here's a £50 ticket. You know, can you support? How many times can you pay until... I'm, a, I'm an avid boxing fan, and I think what, what Eddie's doing is brilliant. You know, as he says, there are no easy fights. And I've just had John, John Edges had his debut at, um, at Milton Keynes, you know? And uh, from experience, <laughs> there are no easy fights, you know? That was a baptism of fire for John. But I can see what the kerfuffle was and all the negativity. Not that I thought he won. He did win. His work rate, he outscored, he outscored the uh, uh, Jack Jan Arden. End of. But the, the negative comments of, a, of the of the commentary from the word go of that first round just led the public to believe that, you know, the opponent was robbed. He was robbed. But John's an entertainer, you know, when he when he boxes, when he boxes in front of audiences, the, the kid is, is is great to watch. And being there was so eerie. You know, I could hear when the first bell went, I could hear David Diamante talking. He's 20 meters behind me just talking to someone else. I can hear a technician over there, you know, and you can hear the punches. You can, you know, you can hear the, the pounding of the punches, but it was just so eerie. And you're thinking, wow, you know, how long is this going to go on for in terms of with the, with, with, with the COVID and behind closed doors? And going back to sort of, you know, the tickets, if that was John's debut in a hall, it's... Uh, he would have packed it out. Just like Joe Laws would have done. Joe Laws is an entertainer. As an amateur, you know, I've seen I've seen the top tier of the York Hall when he's boxed there, full up with Joe Laws supporters. And for him, it must have been, again, the same kind of scenario. scenario. He's come out against Ryland thinking, 
wow. This and, and and John said that the moment he walked out and he walked down that ramp, it hit him. It was like, whoa. Yeah, who, who doesn't get nervous, you know? But again, by being a pro, you need to sell tickets. You need to sell tickets because if you don't, you do need the help of social media. You do need the backing of friends and definitely sponsors. But without them, you know, you're going to get a shortened career. You really are, you know, and it's hard. I've, I've you know, I've, I've got acting, I've got active pros who are all doing with me, just ticking them over at the moment, you know, until they get some kind of fight date. But it's very hard to just keep them stimulated and, and, and in camp. Um, we're just going to wrap up now. We're going to ask you to give the final words of advice for coaches, boxers, boxing clubs, communities, anything that you want to finish off on. Maybe advice, maybe just a positive message. In the current situation, you know, it's, um, it's, it's becoming a little bit soul-destroying with the way that the COVID has taken effect. You know, it's, it's, you know, the kids want to spar, the kids want to pad, but because of these social distance measures, they can't do any. And um, I do believe there's a, there's a petition out at the moment in there to lobbying for these, um, you know, for governments to just, just do a U-turn. I see that they've opened the clubs in Liverpool, which, yeah, absolutely, you know. Uh, and that is, there's word of a lockdown next week, which is, you know, they, these clubs, they just can't survive. You know, they're, they're doing the community, they're doing their communities a service, you know, a justice. And, you know, padding, even padding or sparring is not, it's, it's, it's not going to affect anyone. You know, let them stay in the club, let them keep their interest. It's better than young Johnny being in his bedroom playing with his Xbox. You know, I've got bundles of kids in the gym, did have. But them numbers are starting to diminish, you know. And for a club like us, you know, we've we've still got we've still got bills to pay, you know. Um, and and the mention of a lockdown again, well, well, we'll see where we go. But you know, people need to stay positive. In hindsight, you know, the coaches, with coaches and boxers, they still need to maintain that rapport and that and that connection, you know. And don't distance yourself while while nothing's going on. You know, as with me, I'm switched on twenty four seven. We're always on the WhatsApp groups. We're trying to implement some little 5K runs, 10K runs, just to do things, just to keep everyone stimulated. In hindsight, you know, when are we looking at boxing again? Who knows? I mean, I spoke to Ray from Sweden, and now they've moved They've moved it forward to February 2021. The thing that I can't understand is that recently they've had tournaments, you know, and everyone's going to these tournaments, but yet, unfortunately for England, no youths, you know, no Europeans, for the juniors, it's, it, it must be soul destroying, and so much for the youth now turning eighteen. They're going to look to us as a professional. So I think what we're doing is we're losing a generation of talent to the pro game. You know, um, so amateurs' loss is going to be a pro gain. Full stop. And um, as you'd know, being a coach, when when they're starting to leave your club and seek, you know, professional guidance or just don't want to do it anymore. From a coach, you think all that work that I've done is just gone, it's just gone to pot. It's just, you know, what is the point of being here? And then what that will do mentally is, is have an effect on the coaching, thinking, well, what's the point of going in? Because I can't pad, I can't spar. All I can do is stand there, give instruction. It's not the same. And that can play, you know, that can play uh, sort of games on your mind. And um, with with me personally, you know, like I said, as I said, I've got a great, I've got a great bunch of coaches. I've got an outstanding club. You know, I've got some absolute wonderful talent coming through. And it's, it's, it's just harder than ever now trying to keep them stimulated, believe it or not. Why everything being taken away, it's, this, is, this is now the, how can I say it? This is the important part now, seeing what we can do now. The threat of a second wave and everything is coming, is, you know, is, is sort of lurking. It's all them coaches out there just to stay positive and just, Chin up, or 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 the way things have gone, chins up because <laughs> we're just sitting at home, just twiddling our thumbs, wondering when this is all going to be over. It's a it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. That's that's that that just needs to stop. And I just want to get back into the gym, do what we love doing best, go to the shows, go to the championships. You know, rub shoulders with with with, with, with boxers and coaches alike, perform, win, escalate. Fingers crossed, eh? <laughs>